This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here's your host, Eric Townsend. Macro Voices episode 286 was pre-recorded back in early August 2021. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode is brought to you by Apex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better meet the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by escrow.com, the world's most secure online payment system from a counterparty risk perspective, because the funds sit in escrow. There will be no market wrap or postgame segment this week, but we'll be back to our normal format starting next week. Welcome to part two of our two-part summer series on the decentralized finance revolution. We kicked off this series last week with Dr. Pippa Melmgren and Clint Cox when we talked through digital currency systems, including cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin, central bank digital currencies, and now this week we're going to kick it into high gear, starting with a discussion of Silicon Valley digital currencies. And then we'll broaden the discussion to the decentralized finance revolution more generally, where it's headed and what it means for investors. Let's pick up right where we left off at the end of part one. Let's move on then and include Silicon Valley digital currencies, or SVDCs. Now, Facebook's Libra project was the most visible example to date, but I'm convinced that more projects like that with similar aspirations are already under development behind closed doors. And to be sure, this is where I think most of the conflict of interest exists, because big tech is clearly best equipped to design a global scale digital currency system. But frankly, it's also strongly incentivized to design it for their own benefit rather than for the maximum benefit of society. So the way I see this, going back to Pippa's comments, I think you're exactly right that the central bankers are not going to wake up and and smell the coffee, but I think Silicon Valley will, and I predict that Silicon Valley will design a digital currency system that's purpose, that's design center, is to appeal to central bankers so they can go all around the world, probably not starting with the Federal Reserve, but saying, look, guys, we've designed something better with built-in digital monetary policy tools that are just so much better than anything you have with conventional monetary policy that you need to do this. And I think that what they will try to do is hijack the U.S. government's monopoly over the global financial system and its and its issuance of the global reserve currency by coming up with something better that becomes so big that it's too big to fail and it can't be stopped, kind of like Facebook in the social media space. Pippa, with that perspective, what do you think of the possibility of Silicon Valley designing something which maybe gives central bankers tools that we'd prefer they not have? Well, let's talk about two interesting phenomena. One is GPT-3, and the other is something that actually Clint and I were talking about yesterday in preparation for this podcast, which is Rally. So GPT-3 is put in really simple terms. It's the ability to code in plain English. So more and more, uh, like, you know, when you make a website on Wix, And it's really easy because it's in plain English. You don't have to be a coder to build that website anymore. Wix lets you do it in English. Well, this is happening across the board. And there's a wave that is coming. And it's effectively a democratization of the access to the capacity to code anything, including money itself. So I think we're going to see a wave of um, competitors to Silicon Valley. Uh, Your largeness alone won't guarantee that you maintain a monopoly position, although it's going to be a super interesting fight between the little startups and and the big players, the David and Goliath scenario. And we'll see, again, as Clint said earlier, whether people prefer to be in the Amazon tribe where they buy and transact everything on Amazon or whether they want to be part of something that's even more decentralized, because that's obviously a very centralized world to live in. And that's where Rally comes in. And again, I'm going to defer to Clint because he knows so much more about this. But I think Rally is very interesting in that it's permitting regular people, not just famous people, 
to create their own coin and to get to interact with their followers, not having to be, you know, Jennifer Lopez to do it, you know, that anybody can begin to create a community using plain English to create your own coin. Maybe, Clint, can I defer to you on this to tell us a bit more about that piece of it? Yeah, I mean, I I think it's important to understand, like, when you're looking at these different platforms where these influencers participate, you know, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, you know, they're kind of at the whim of whatever those new rules are, however they wish to, you know, or they could be, you know, shut off, whatever. There's a lot of different ways that they can make money off of that with advertising and stuff like that. But there's a lot of other things that they leave on the table because these, you know, these influencers have influence over huge numbers of people, millions of people. And so what if you could take that and, you know, with the decentralized monetization system, enable you a sustainable form of revenue just because you have a community, not because they're on YouTube or Twitter or anything else, but because they follow you. And so what Rally allows these creators to do is actually have their own coin that's part of this ecosystem. And the bigger the ecosystem is, the more successful Rally is. Now, you know, I I think that's one of those things where as you're looking at this, I think it becomes really, really interesting to say that this is the kind of innovation where people are going to start creating their own groups and saying, what if we do this? And everyone in the group benefits. That's what's going to become fascinating is those are the types of things that can grow up from not much to become really big. So far, we've been talking about digital currency systems. We'll broaden the discussion to decentralized finance right after this message from our sponsor. This episode of Macro Voices was brought to you by Abex, a fintech company traded under ticker symbol ABXXF on the OTCQX in the United States and ABXX on the Equitas Neo in Canada. Abex was founded on the principle of creating market-based solutions to solve the world's most challenging problems. Two of these issues in particular, the energy transition and climate change, are creating once-in-a-generation opportunities for investors. Abex is leveraging proprietary Web 3.0 technologies to digitize and accelerate the velocity and security of commodity trading markets, beginning with liquefied natural gas and carbon. Investors seeking exposure to the fintech applications powering this new era of the ESG economy can visit www.abex.tech or www.abex.exchange or check out ABXX on the Equitas Neo or ABXXF on the OTCQX exchanges. So far, we've been talking about the currency system. So let's move on now to the broader trend, which has become known as decentralized finance or DeFi for short. We're talking here about using the same basic invention of secure digital bearer instruments. But this time, the instrument is not a unit of currency, but rather it could be a share of stock, a bond, any other conventional financial asset, or for that matter, any other kind of asset, including some that we haven't even invented yet. So let's start with the big picture, high level overview of this new trend. How advanced is DeFi at this point? I'm not sure we even have everybody agreeing on what it means. How big of a deal is it going to be and why is it so important? Clint, why don't we start with you for this one? So yeah, I mean, I I think uh, DeFi, and let's just talk about the size of the growth, right? So DeFi as a sector was back in February of 2020 was about a billion dollars. By September 2020, it was 10 billion and it's currently about 75 billion. So you can see that is crazy fast growth. Um, that's really amazing. And I think as you just, you know, you just insinuated, there's all kinds of definitions for DeFi, right? So I think, you know, there, there's part of it, which is taking the old and translating it into the new, such as tokenized stocks. You know, and part of the advantage here is going from this T plus three to T plus zero, you know, so you trade it and it's done now and it's, you can trade it 24, seven, 365. You know, there's groups like Bittrex, which does have a a large number of tokenized stocks. Uh, And these are common stocks like Apple, you know, Microsoft, Tesla, that kind of stuff. But that's still centralized. They, you know, you cannot take or transfer your stocks off of Bittrex or the value of those stocks off of Bittrex. Uh, And then on Binance, they just announced that they're they're taking stock tokens off uh, forever. 
Like by October, they're done with all of this tokenized stock idea. But there's a much, much bigger idea here. And that is replicating the entire financial system in a decentralized way. And I think that that's what, you know, inside the crypto world, that's what we're really talking about is how do we replicate what's out there? So this means, you know, lending, trading, investments, insurance, you know, all kinds of payment systems, settlement layers, all of that in a decentralized way. So I think that that's really, that's really where we're headed. And that's what's created this huge growth. And part of that is because of what's called proof of stake. And proof of stake is instead of proof of work where you have Bitcoin miners and other miners out there with these, you know, GPUs and, you know, all, all these computers trying to compete to basically use energy to show, show that, you know, this is the legitimacy of that block. So instead of doing that, it's proof of stake. How much are you willing to purchase of these cryptos and then basically lock it up and say, I'm, I'm going to stake it right here. I'm not going to move it. I'm not going to use it. And I'm staking it and I get to have it, you know, some kind of decision making power over what happens. And so if you stake tokens, you have the, you know, this idea of, oh, well, maybe I'll get some return. And you do. It's, it's programmed. So, you know, the yield that you can get from staking tokens can be anywhere from, you know, on the low side, a few percent up to 30, 40 percent in some cases. You know, I, I would say the average is a little below 10 percent, but with the 10 year treasury yielding one to one and a quarter percent, you know, 5 percent, 10 percent, that starts looking pretty good. Well, if you start lending with that and trading with that and doing investments with that and getting insurance on that, you're in creating this entirely different system. So there are a bunch of different categories when you look at DeFi. You know, right now you've got like exchanges, decentralized exchanges, which are called DEX. You've got lending, derivatives, insurance, asset management, wallets, oracles, which actually go out there and retrieve, you know, the data that actually triggers smart contracts, um, scaling, analytics, stable coins. These are all things that basically are part of that system and have different cryptos involved with, you know, there's multiple cryptos involved with each of those categories I just described. Um, so I, it, it's pretty amazing. They're taking the intermediaries out. And, you know, here's the thing. You control it. You control it, right? So I think there's an upside here and a downside here. You know, the upside is, you know, you get all these new services. Anyone can participate. It's completely transparent. You get, you know, right now, at least you get better returns. But, you know, they got the downside, too. There's a lot of risk, lack of regulatory you know, oversight, and the SEC is coming. And you got really high leverage that could turn into you know, something ugly if it's not controlled. So a lot of upside, a lot of downside. But in the end, this is an entirely different world that is growing. And, you know, once again, a billion dollars a year ago, 75 billion today. That's amazing growth. Pippa? How big of a deal is DeFi to society at large, and how much does it change society's interaction with government? <laughs> so I'm, I'm putting a whole chapter in my new book on this. It's so enormous. It's back to what we, what we opened with. We're talking about profound changes in society that you won't work for a single employer, you'll work for multiple employers at the same time. Um, to be honest, once you are making finance fractional in this way and so easily accessible, I do suspect that it'll spill over into culture and you'll be also to, able to have, I, I know it sounds kind of crazy, but lots, multiple families at the same time. It's a kind of natural progression. If you have the power to sustain different households and, and fractional finance permits this, I don't know, I could see that, that we go in that direction too. I mean, it literally will challenge the morals and the mores of modern society and make us rethink all of these very fundamental ideas about relationships between people, between institutions, between types of organizations and others. So I know it sounds sort of both shocking and vague what I'm saying, but I think this is why I keep saying it's like the Wild West of our time. It is so unclear 
how how DeFi as a broad category doesn't just disintermediate the banks. It's going to disintermediate culture itself. It's going to create a whole new set of assumptions and relationships. Again, as, as Clint said earlier, you don't need legal contracts anymore in this environment. Well, if that's the case, then what happens to the whole court system, legal injustice enforcement? Maybe it takes place through money itself. And as, as you said, Clint, it happens immediately. You know, if you get into a dispute with somebody, it becomes like public immediately. And you don't dare get into disputes with people because its impact on your life is so severe. Like there's, there's just an unlimited possibility here. And that's the important thing for people to think about. This is not going to be the old culture taken into this new financial system. The financial system itself will change culture. It will change how we conduct war and conflict. I mean, again, to go back in history, you know, Genghis Khan had two inventions that led to the creation of the largest area of of control of power, territorial power known in history. One was the invention of the stirrup. It sounds so small, but it's only with the stirrup that you're able to wear armor. So suddenly you had armored humans on horseback, which is a massive strategic advantage over humans that were not armored. But the other invention that he brought was paper money. And paper money contributed enormously to the creation of that empire. And so do we really think we can create digital fractional money and not have it radically change the culture just as Genghis Khan's empire radically changed the culture of of the eastern part of Europe, of what we used to call Persia and India. I mean, it totally radically changed their culture. This is going to change ours as well. And and you can say, well, I'm scared by that. Well, culture is always changing. It's just the speed at which this is happening is so quick and the direction is so unknown. But cultural change is a permanent feature of the landscape. But our ability to process it, that is not very high. So I am anticipating enormous cultural change as a result of these new technologies. Pippa, you're saying that this is a complete unknown. It's going to be profound cultural change, and we don't even know where it's headed. Yet already we're seeing DeFi funds and ETFs being launched. And quite frankly, based on what I saw of Wall Street almost taking a decade to figure out what Bitcoin is, I'm not so sure about my confidence in all of the fund managers to pick the best horses to bet in in this race. So is this just a a shotgun type of investment strategy where you can't tell where the winners are going to be and you invest in everything? Or is it possible, uh, I'm going to ask Clint Cox particularly, because you actually do this for a living, to take that rifle investment strategy where you really try to pick the winners in a game which really is very, very early in a long-term evolution, which we don't know where it's headed yet. So, you know, I, I think you, you know, put your finger on it is how do you approach this? You know, and, and because this is a new sector, new industry, you know, we only have a decade's worth of data to even look at. And that's just for Bitcoin, right? I mean, a lot of this stuff haven't, hasn't even been around for a decade. So, you know, when we first started this, we spent months looking at actually the FANG stocks, some of the stuff that you mentioned. You know, we looked at Facebook, Amazon, Google, Netflix, Apple. We looked at these companies and we said, okay, what are the technologies? What are the factors that made these companies successful? And which of these factors might apply to crypto? What are the things that we need to be thinking about? You know, then we sat down, we worked with data engineers to figure out what are the best metrics to measure the factors that we think are important. And that, that's how we basically, you know, we started looking at the DeFi market is how do we approach, you know, what we think will be successful long-term? How do we approach the market, get the data we need to make the decisions that we need to make? So if I'm talking about, you know, to other investors and to folks looking at this, you know, the first thing is you got to do your research. You got to understand these markets. It's really difficult. It's really difficult for beginners to basically get into this and really understand it, but incredibly rewarding. I mean, one of the things that we like to do, you know, you ask about shotgun or rifle, 
we look at different DeFi categories, some of the stuff that we talked about earlier, you know, exchanges, you know, decentralized exchanges, lending, derivatives, insurance, oracles, all that stuff. We look at each of those and then we pick what we think are the best players from each of those categories. Like, you know, this might be the best here, this might be the best here, or we might choose two or three, which we think are leaders. And there's a lot of different factors that go into choosing. But I think it's when we look at all of those different categories, uh, I don't think every crypto within each category is going to be successful. It, it just doesn't work like that. So yeah, you have to be pretty precise, but I think you also have to cover a variety of different areas because I think it's very difficult to say one company's going to win. I mean, look at the winners from the internet cycle. It's been really difficult to pick the winners, you know, especially if you were doing this back in the mid nineties. But, you know, when you get into, you know, today you see who the winners are, that's very difficult, but you know, the other adage is, you know, the rising tide lifts all boats, you know, maybe in some ways that's true. If DeFi continues to grow, I mean, there's going to be a lot of winners, but you know, the internet is that cautionary tale. There's bound to be a lot of complete losers too. Pippa, how do we navigate this new landscape with, you know, DeFi funds, ETFs? Are these things smart to invest in or are they just guesses at this point? You know, I think that if you, if you want to understand the future, you've got to get involved. I think, you know, as an economist, I made a decision in my career to get involved in the building of the real economy and trying to understand these instruments. So there's a learning curve. And so I think you can't be an armchair investor. You can't sit back and say, well, I'll just observe. I think somebody needs to get involved in order to learn. Having said that, I don't know if you guys remember some years ago, there was a company called Thinkorswim, and it ended up being sold to GE three times. They bought a piece, then they bought another piece, then they bought the whole thing outright. And the thing about Thinkorswim was that it was, it was such a simple idea. It was designed to teach investors about derivatives. And it's not that long ago that investors had no idea what a derivative was. Like that's, that's literally only, you know, 30 years ago that people were like, what's a derivative? You know, how do you play with that? It's, it was the same level as your question now, should we get involved? And so Thinkorswim was created by um, uh, a former colleague of mine, and it was designed to teach, just teach people about derivatives, give them a trading platform when they can play around with it without actually having to put real money at stake but give them the experience so they can see they thought they made a good trade and they got killed. And people were incredibly loyal to that platform. They loved it. And then GE bought it. And what was interesting was GE thought what they were buying was a customer base. And so they didn't want to invest anything in teaching because that was like an unnecessary overhead. And actually, the whole community disbanded because what they really paid for and wanted was the learning. And so I predict someone is going to create the think or swim of this crypto DeFi movement and teach people all the stuff that, you know, Clint knows so much about. I don't know who that is, but I'm just predicting if someone does that, then that's going to make a fortune. Because, because there's no way you can really do this by yourself. It's already a decade too late. You're, you're so far behind. So, you know, my answer is yes, you got to get involved. But boy, the market definitely needs somebody who's going to provide some teaching as well. Now I'd like to run a couple of ideas past both of you, which I proposed in my book three years ago, but frankly, which I haven't heard many other people talking about. The first is that I think we have the opportunity to completely re-engineer the 500-year-old fractional banking system, not just the currency system, but the entire fractional reserve system. And specifically, what I'm talking about today is that almost all money, what we call the M1 money supply, is loaned into existence by commercial banks. So implicit the commercial banking system kind of has a monopoly on loaning money into existence. And I would propose that there are better ways to extend credit that does not require fractionalization of the, uh, of the money system the way it has existed for hundreds of years. I think there's a better way to do this, which involves a digital currency system that 
includes features to extend credit in ways other than fractionalizing the banking system. Now, of course, it's entirely possible to fractionize uh, Bitcoin or any other digital currency system, and that's already been done. But I'm really thinking that that, frankly, you know, feels to me like you're, you're trying to point searchlights at, at solar panels in order to create electricity. It's not a sensible way of doing things. I think we need to look at the entire fractional reserve banking system and re-engineer it from the ground up. To my surprise, I'm not aware of anybody who's really looking at that problem and trying to think about it as a technologist in terms of how to do it. So am I on to something here? Does this make sense? And uh, Clint, in particular, I'm curious if you've heard anything I haven't around someone actually starting to work on this problem. Yeah, I would say, you know, as far as that specifically and, and taking a look at the fractional reserve banking system, you know, I, I'm sure there's been conversations around the water cooler, maybe at the Fed and Treasury and things like that. But, uh, you know, I I think if nothing else, I think bankers know that the handwriting's on the wall. Like there is change coming. And once again, even as we talked about earlier, I think you're going to see every bank have some level of embracing of blockchain and crypto. They, they have to. And for investment's sake, they have to. Uh, I think there's a lot of reasons. So I think they'll embrace digital assets. It makes for better, more efficient banks in the end. And I think they're realizing that as certain banks are embracing it, all the banks have to embrace it because they don't want to get left behind. So, you know, I, I still think we're going to have very strong, powerful banks. I don't think that's going away. But when you start looking at what does this digital currency revolution look like, I don't think it displaces banks necessarily in the initial stages here. You know, it may take over some of the, the bit parts and things like that, but it's not going to, you know, make their role obsolete. I, I think it'll create immense value elsewhere. And I think as you start looking at that fractional reserve system, you look at like, what's the basis of that? Why would you do that? How do you do that? And I think you're really going to start looking at these ecosystems, you know, DeFi, NFTs, rewards programs, micropayments. I think, you know, and, and Pepper alluded to this earlier, you know, getting paid by the task instead of getting paid by the hour. Uh, you know, we haven't even gotten into digital identity and, and AML and KYC. I mean, I think one of the things that bankers would love to do is, digitize the AML KYC portion of their business, because that's such a pain. You know, you have OFAC, you have all these other regulations around it, and that's a real issue. So I think, you know, part of it will be as they digitize that, how does that change the way the banking system works? And once you have digital identity and you can use these zero knowledge proofs and other things to make sure that, hey, I want to show somebody that I fit a criteria. I mean, the easy one to say is I would love for, you know, the bouncer to be able to see that I'm 21 and I can get into this club, but I don't want this bouncer to see where my address, you know, where I live. So it's like you can show the necessary information without showing all the information. I think there's a lot of things like that that will, you know, come into the market. One of the other things with the digital currency revolution is supply chain management. And as you know, banks get involved in a very large way in supply chains, right? You've got all this foreign currency exchange, You've got a big business surrounding this. Well, a lot of that is because supply chains, right? How they work, how they go between countries. Well, I think there's going to be a lot of things that come from crypto, blockchain, things like that, that allow for you know, a real enlargement of the way banks operate in those realms. So micro bonuses based on ESG or location, speed of delivery, consistency. Like I think there's a lot of things to, to do with instant payments, efficiencies in shipping, and how you're no longer going to have to use the local currencies. You're going to be able to use these larger corporate currencies. So how does that fit back with the fractional reserve banking system? I think you're going to have multiple versions of that. And the question, once again, comes down to interoperability. How is all this stuff going to work together? How are you going to lend? Well, right now, DeFi, there's a lot of lending based on these staking mechanisms. And I think that there's going to be a lot more of that. And so will that transform the world as we know it? Yeah. You know, but what are some of the other bonuses from this? Reduce fraud, free up, you know, all these foreign currency accounts, empowering people in struggling economies. You know, if you have a phone, if you have a, you know, a smartphone, you can actually participate in this economy. You know, instant digital microinsurance, uh, credentialing. Do you have the skills? You know, then you should be credentialed that you have those skills. You know, so I, I think 
there's a lot of ways that this will influence that greater question of the fractional reserve system. The question is whether corporations and these small innovators will innovate so fast that basically the you know these fractional reserve banking systems will have to catch up. And I'm not sure what that looks like, but I think it's going to be really messy and really exciting over the next couple of decades. Pippa, I'm going to ask you to respond to a hypothetical scenario. Let's suppose that within the next year or two, Google or one of the other tech behemoths comes out and introduces something that's, you know, three times bigger and grander than Libra was. They've really invented an electronic digital money system that is going to integrate with all of their other products and it's going to be super easy to use and it's going to be popular for people because it's it's so easy and it's integrated with your phone and everything else. And and guess what? It actually offers a better way to structure lending and everybody figures out, wait a minute, this really is better than the fractional reserve system, it would make sense for the entire economy to work on this. But that threatens the existence of the entire conventional banking system, where there's a huge amount of political capital parked right now. What happens? How does government deal with the advent of technology that potentially wrong foots the most powerful actors and the most powerful influencers in, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the people that, that pay the biggest campaign contributions, which frankly is Wall Street. What if suddenly big tech invented a better kind of money that replaces the banking system and does a better job? Well, it wouldn't be the first time in history. We've seen over many generations a shift in you know, who, who controls, who has power. I mean, we went from, you know, princes and royal families in Europe to one in which bankers actually had more power than those political leaders. You know, that's what Machiavelli wrote about was the transition from you as prince, you think you have all this power, but actually the bankers have it. And here's how to manage this situation, right? It was like a user manual for the shift in the power structure. And um, this will happen again. And yeah, so then, you know, people wake up one morning and go, wow, I, I used to be fill in the blank. And now that doesn't even exist as a profession anymore. Bankers are just as susceptible to that as, you know, farmers in the last century. So what I think is more interesting is, um, let me try this idea on you. I'm going to kind of shift the lens. We assume that money has to include several different features. It's It's got to be a store of value and a unit account and a medium of exchange. But they don't have to all be embedded. That money could actually exist that is a unit of account, a medium of exchange, but it doesn't move around in the price. It's stable. And so that unlocks a kind of barter element in the economy, which I think this digital money is going to do. And it's going to be like putting turbochargers on the world economy because suddenly you'll be able to unlock a huge amount of value through barter that previously you needed to have money in order to to transact. But I'll go even further than that. You know, what I find really interesting is what is the one thing throughout all of human history that every religion says you shouldn't do when it comes to money? They all say you shouldn't charge interest, right? It's the one thing, the Bible, you know, the Islamic community, everybody says usury is a very bad thing. Well, actually, with the advent of digital money and the separation of store of value, unit of account, medium of exchange, we could introduce money that doesn't charge interest. And I don't think this is such a radical idea. We could see a world where the additional value or the cost of a transaction isn't based on an interest rate. It might be based on a set of behaviors and you get paid, as Clint just mentioned, if you're really good in ESG, suddenly, you know, you will get a benefit from that, but, but there's no interest rate, right? Cause it's not about lending in the traditional sense. I'll go even further and say, most societies that we that humans have constructed 
have traditionally treated money and borrowing as a cyclical phenomena rather than a linear one. So we currently treat this as linear. You're going to borrow the money now and you're going to have to pay it back by a deadline. And if you don't, then that's a default. Most previous societies said all loans only last seven years and doesn't matter what you do in seven years, that whole loan is just going to disappear. It, it's just cyclical. It's circular in nature. Um, the Babylonians and the Sumerians invented this approach. Well, in a digital currency world where everybody's almost using money as if it's a game, you know the rules of engagement are for seven years, you have to do something with the money. If you don't do something productive, A, you lose the opportunity and B, you might not qualify to be in the game again. So you still have an incentive to perform, right? To not like take the money and run because then you can, nobody will let you in the game again. But if you know that if there's a screw up, if you don't get it right, that instead of being in hawk for the rest of your life, like student loans, where you can never escape from that burden, you know that in seven years, if you fail, yes, there's a price to pay, but it's not a financial price. It's an access to the system price. Think of how profoundly that would change human relationships in modern society. How profoundly would that change our willingness and capacity to take risk? So when you ask me this question, you know, could we shift to you know, some corporate digital unit of money? I'm like, yeah, but what's really interesting is it might not involve interest. It might not involve any fluctuation in the value of the currency, and it might not involve debt that would have to be, that would be defaulted on, that would just automatically be built into the system, just like we used to do in the old days. So the disentangling of value and unit of account and exchange and the need for usury suddenly could all disappear and, and change our world radically. And that's where banks are no longer needed because all of those functions are just totally different than they were before. And a fascinating thing about that, Pippa, is that a lot of these cryptos, you know, especially the proof of stake cryptos, they already have yield built into them. So the need to actually gain interest could actually be transformed and shifted somewhere else instead of the banks thinking, hey, we need to make money off of, you know, all these people doing the things for us. It switches it to, hey, if we stake you know, the most popular of these proof of stake cryptos, we actually are going to make yield anyway. We don't have to worry about putting our thumb down on these folks or these folks. Totally. It's, a, it's like a bit of mind melting that we're talking about. You have to unlearn what you know about money and finance and, and rethink, is it true that you must charge interest with a loan? Answer, no, it's not true. It's just the way we've chosen to do it for the last few millennia. But that doesn't mean that it has to be done that way. And the other thing, when you get to interoperability, you know, once you have credentialing and you have all these other things where someone can bring value from other things, it might not be something that you would get paid in U.S. dollars to pay the bank back with. But they may have some kind of credentialing, some kind of trust, something that they can trade in exchange for, and it you know basically translates and goes into that payment system to repay a loan. There's a lot of different ways to look at this, and that's what I mean by barter. I you, you could almost imagine, you know, if a if a you know super famous uh, rock star says, you know, in the end I I tried a venture, uh, it didn't work, so I'm not paying the money back because I can't, but I will provide the lender with something I do with them that brings them a fan base and a followership that they never would have had otherwise, actually that trade may be more valuable than getting paid back interest on the thing. Like you, you, you can now have a, you can turn your voice into currency, literally. A, a human can turn their network effect into a valuable currency. It doesn't have to be that you can only pay back with money and financial interest. Suddenly a whole lot of things become monetizable 
in this environment. Next, I want to talk about my vision of a digital sovereign bond market. That's coming up right after this message from our sponsor. Escrow.com is the payment system for buying and selling anything of value. Cars, boats, airplanes, jewelry, gemstones, fine art, collectibles, intellectual property rights, domain names, bringing in shipping containers from overseas, or even buying and selling entire businesses. It's simple to use. Either party sets up the transaction, then the buyer sends the funds to escrow.com. The seller is then instructed to send the goods to the buyer to inspect. Within the inspection period, the buyer can return the items for any reason. After that, Escrow.com pays the seller immediately. Escrow.com is the world's most secure payment system from a counterparty risk perspective because the funds sit in escrow. Over 2 million customers have transacted over $5 billion on escrow.com, and eBay and Shopify use it for cars, boats, luxury watches, and business sales. It's available in the United States, Canada, and Australian dollars, euros, and British pounds. Never buy or sell anything online unless you use escrow.com. Escrow.com is a subsidiary of freelancer.com, listed on the OTCQX best markets under the ticker symbol FLNCF and the Australian Securities Exchange under the ticker FLN. Let's move on now to the second idea that I'd love both of your feedback on, which is my contention that a digital sovereign bond market is an absolutely essential aspect of the DeFi revolution. To understand this, we have to take a big step back and consider the purpose for which central bank reserve assets exist in the first place. Why do they exist and how do the problems that are solved today with the U.S. dollar, could they be better solved? And I contend that DeFi enables an entirely new invention, a digital sovereign bond market that works completely differently than conventional sovereign debt and which could be vastly superior to U.S. Treasury bonds or any other conventional central bank reserve asset. Now, the reason that this is so important is that it implies that the advent of this digital sovereign bond market and the availability of these digital sovereign bonds that are a better central bank reserve asset than U.S. Treasuries that I'm describing would essentially terminate the U.S. dollar's hegemony over the global financial system, unless that new system was a digital dollar that the U.S. uh, government was in control of. So central banks would presumably favor that superior asset. And I contend there's enough people that are annoyed with U.S. foreign policy right now around the world that they would have already ditched the U.S. dollar as uh, the, the central bank reserve asset if there were a viable alternative, and there has been no viable alternative to the U.S. dollar. I contend when somebody invents one, central bankers around the world will be quicker than the U.S. government thinks to abandon the U.S. dollar. And eventually, Robert Triffin's uh, dilemma that was posited more than a half century ago will be resolved in favor of a digital currency system replacing the U.S. dollar as the global reserve system. But it's not even just replacing the currency. It's replacing the reserve system with a smarter, better reserve system based on digital sovereign bonds, which could have features using smart contracts and so forth. So, you know, if you've got an oil producing nation, you could potentially tie the repayment of its sovereign debt to its oil income so that there are controls and uh, abilities to prevent the next guy that takes office if there's regime change from defaulting on the last guy's debt. What do each of you think of this notion that a new digital central bank reserve asset could be engineered for the purpose of displacing the U.S. dollar as the global reserve currency by creating a superior reserve asset that treasuries could never compete with. And for PIPA in particular, I'm really thinking about, boy, what are the geopolitical consequences if somebody invents something which is basically handing the other central banks around the world an easy way to move away from the U.S. dollar, not what the U.S. government wants to hear. Pippa, why don't we start with that? I know Clint's got a lot to say on the the technology and what can make this work. Well, I think that it's easy to imagine the creation of an instrument that investors would have more confidence in than sovereign debt. Because, you know, these days, frankly, you know, what's the capacity to repay? You start looking at small African nations and realizing that actually they ought to have a higher credit rating 
than the U.S. government or, frankly, many Western European governments. Like, you know, our whole methodology for deciding who's got a high credit rating and who's got a low one is kind of crazy and doesn't really match reality. But so let's imagine for a moment you create something that's blockchain based, that's dispersed and there and therefore a high degree trustable that the market could have more confidence in that than any sovereign debt instrument. So I, that's not hard to imagine. The second thing is that this has happened before. And here's an example I know that you and I have talked about before, Eric, which is when John F. Kennedy started to tax U.S. bonds, U.S. corporate bonds in 1962, because he thought he had a massive government deficit and he wanted to generate revenue to fix the deficit. And some guys at Morgan Stanley in London basically said, hey, what if we sold these you know, US corporate bonds out of London? Then it wouldn't attract the tax and everybody would want to buy from here. And that was the that's literally what created the now trillion dollar euro bond market. Right. So it's, it's this is not a new idea. You can create new debt instruments. It's just we don't do it very often. And I think the biggest constraint is not the technical ability. The biggest constraint is imagination. And people in finance have been so heavily trained to be analytical and to think that their quantitative assessment skills are where the juice is that they forget that every single innovation in finance is always fundamentally an act of imagination. You imagine new financial assets into being. And that's exactly what you do in government, right? When there's a crisis of some kind, you literally like, okay, let's make something up. And that's that's was the origin of Brady bonds to deal with the Latin American financial crisis, right? You literally just make up a new category in order to attract capital. So this is completely doable. It will definitely happen. The question is then what do governments do when it happens? And we're witnessing the early stages of that where government comes out and tries to shut down Binance, tries to shut down to a degree, you know, Bitcoin by, you know, saying you shouldn't be dealing in this and it's really a bad actor thing to do. But the thing is, the utility is so high, it survives anyway. So we're seeing right now this lashing out at the technology, hoping it'll just go away. It isn't working. It isn't going to go away. And so will it culminate in something that causes the majority of humans on the planet to say, I'd rather hold this digital asset because I trust it more then I trust this sovereign entity. Yeah. What are you going to do? Hold them at gunpoint and say, no, you have to buy my bonds. Like, you know, this is then the, the fundamental question arises. What gives a, a bond market value? Is it the military? And that, that's a really interesting question in history. Is your military strong enough to enforce the adherence? Some people say, yeah, that's what it all come down to. Others go, you know what, you can hold a gun to their face and they're still going to buy the thing that makes more financial sense. So it's, it's a very interesting question of geopolitics. Clint, what would it take to get this DeFi revolution to the point where we're actually looking at central bank reserve assets as the thing that's being replaced with digital assets? So, yeah, I think this is a great question. I, I think you're really, you know, you're touching on a subject that I think is going to change everything, right? And that is when we start looking at sovereign bonds, when we start looking at the U.S. dominance of this entire system and the U.S. dollar and world reserve status, you know, I, I think it's important. We always refer to, you know, the, the dollar as the world reserve currency, and, and that's true, but it's not the only reserve currency, right? So when you look at the, you know, the IMF's SDR, you're looking at the US dollar, the euro, Japanese yen, Chinese RMB, and the, the UK pound, right? So it, this is not in a world by itself. Um, and, and we also trade a lot of, you know, Australian dollars, Canadian dollars, Swiss francs. So, you know, it's it's not just displacing the US dollar. It's, it's how do you become a player in that realm of those, say, eight to 10 different global reserves? And I think that's going to be the first step is breaking into that group. And I, Honestly, I think Bitcoin is really fascinating because this is all about trust. And, you know, 
I think Pippa hinted at this, you know, when, it, when we're talking about trust, you know, part of it comes down to your military. You know, you can trust that the U.S. is going to take you out if you do something stupid along the lines of trying to take out the U.S. dollar. Maybe that's true. But if you look at the history of world reserve currencies, it's also dependent on the strength of your financial system, your laws, your trade dominance, you know, your resources. So I think when we're looking at that, it's really important to understand that trust is really key. So is your economy. And that's where something like Bitcoin, you know, that's amazing because it is highly trustworthy. You know, this thing has never been hacked. So, you know, in a world where all of our banks, all of our government agencies are getting hacked on a regular basis, you've got something that hasn't been hacked. That's pretty amazing. That creates a lot of trust. So that's like the baseline. But then you're talking about DeFi, right? How do we get to this next level? Well, you know, you could pool some of these bonds, maybe in a particular you know, fund. You could digitize you know, the ownership of them, and then you could put those out there and start creating new instruments. I think Pip is exactly right. You have to have creativity. And if nothing else, the U.S. has been phenomenal at financial creativity in creating financial instruments. You know, I mean, that's we've been great at that. Uh, so I think there's still a lot of hope that something could come out of this, that there will be some system that comes out of DeFi where we figure out, OK, we can leverage this into this. We can hold this as a core asset, leverage that into this. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens. I mean, I, I guess the two things that have brought, you know, world reserve currencies to an end and that might challenge the most are. You know, in the past, it's been war or collapsed global trade. And I think those two things, war and collapsed global trade, those have been the dictators of, you know, the collapse of a world reserve currency. Now, there's also been one example of, you know, and that's the Netherlands with, with the Dutch East India Company and the creation of the corporation. It can be something positive, too. So I think the, the real question here as we look at this is, can the, the U.S., innovate and do something great that creates a new value in the U.S. dollar, maybe a digital dollar, and can we avoid global war? You know, so I think those are kind of the questions that, you know, I think about in a lot of different ways. By the way, can I just point out that SDRs were also made up out of thin air? Like that was, that was that concept of creating special drawing rights in the world economy and the IMF, this was all in 1969 when we were having that Triffin overhang that you referred to before, Eric. Like, again, you have a practical problem and what you bring to it is creative imagination. And, and Clint, you're so right. What the U.S. has excelled in for all of modern history is this creative, imaginative approach to finance. And I think this is absolutely going to persist. And this is why this podcast is actually, to me, really valuable to have the opportunity to talk at length about this and to help people understand this question about crypto. It's not technical. It's an active imagination. It's, it requires an active imagination to understand it. This is not something where there are clear and simple like rules of the game. And if you just analyze it correctly, mathematically, you'll figure it out. No, this is about imaginative capacity. And, and Pippa, there's no reason why when you look at the IMF and, you know, the special drawing rights, that is an amazing innovation, right? And that has changed the way we look at global finance. Well, you know, the BIS, the IMF, all these groups are looking at crypto. They're looking at CBDCs. It is quite possible that out of one of those organizations comes something new, comes a new innovation where they say, OK, a number of the G7 has agreed to do this or, you know, OECD has agreed to do this. There's a lot of different ways that this could play out. And there's a lot of meetings happening in back rooms to discuss this exact topic. I want to activate both of your imaginations now because the reason I brought up these two topics of re-engineering the fractional reserve banking system and a digital sovereign bond market is they're examples of things that I think will be incredibly important that almost nobody has even bothered to start thinking about yet. So now I want to ask both of you, Pippa, what are the consequences and implications of this digital finance and decentralization revolution that has already begun? 
that nobody's thought of and that maybe people need to start thinking about? Well, I go back to what I said earlier. I, I don't want to repeat, but I really do think that the consequences will be genuinely cultural and societal. We will no longer have careers that are sequential and linear. We'll have a life of portfolio of activities, working for many different kinds of organizations, solving many different kinds of problems. The legal system will dramatically change because you won't need contracts to reinforce deals because money itself becomes so trustable that the money is the contract. I just think culturally, the way we think about power relationships will will change because we won't need to work for firms anymore. The, the whole concept that has been around since the East India Company was introduced, that you need to work for an organization that provides a roof over your head No, you don't. And people will fluidly come together more like in swarms or, you know, like a, they call it, uh, I think it's called a murder of starlings. It's a very beautiful, or murmuration of starlings. When you see birds, they all flock together and create shapes in the sky. This will be what business looks like, that the beautiful structures created just because groups are moving. And in fact, data is already doing that by itself. So the humans are just going to follow the data into this highly fluid state. In fact, there's a really interesting writer, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but he writes about the liquid economy, where he's talking about the speed, the pace of change is so great. It runs so hot and so fast. The economy isn't just fluid. It's actually liquid. And and managing in the sea of that kind of liquid flux is a whole different way of living than one in which you still you know, have some, you're, it's like going from being a sailor on an open ocean to being a scuba diver that's permanently in the water with, it's just a, a different way of behaving. So to me, that's what this whole digital currency phenomena is about the broader societal changes that it necessarily will create. And, um, and whether we like it or not, we'll have to live with those consequences. And I think some of them will be really good. Some of them may not be so good. And what we have to do, this generation, everyone listening on this podcast needs to think about what part will I play in defining this new vast digital kind of holographic space that we are now all in, but there's kind of no established rules of the game yet. And and what part are we going to play in defining the rules of that game? Clint, what are the most innovative ideas and projects that you've heard of in this DeFi revolution that's already begun? And what are the most innovative and disruptive ideas that you can think of for things that maybe haven't started yet but ought to? Boy, that's a, that's a mouthful there. Um, first of all, I am horrified, Eric, just thinking about us listening to this podcast three years from now. It's going to be completely embarrassing, right? Because so many things are going to happen between now and then uh, that change uh, all the things that we're talking about today. But Uh, It's definitely exciting to think along these lines. So, you know, there's a lot of projects. There's a lot of things that have happened that already exist in this market, you know, that allow for innovation and things that change everything. I mean, first of all, let's just talk about what does DeFi do? How does that change things? And I I think looking at what um, Pippa just talked about, you know, the new ways to think about work, the new ways to think about payments, we haven't even touched on the metaverse, and I certainly don't want us to go down that road uh, too far. But when we start thinking about, you know, when I talk with my son about how he views, you know, we watch The Matrix, and, you know, I was like, hey, do you take the red pill or the blue pill? And he's like, man, you stay inside the Matrix. You see how nasty it is outside of the Matrix? You know, it's like, wow. So for the younger generation, they're looking at the digital world as an entirely different place their digital identity is often as important as what we would call our analog or real identities in the world, right? Because they spend their time in these digital worlds. 
So I think what DeFi is going to do is it's going to level the playing field. And I would say this, you know, in an emotional way for sure, because if you're somebody in whatever digital world you're in, that provides the same amount of, you know, real uplift as maybe doing that in the real world, being in relationships in the real world. It's a different thing altogether. And of course, you know, I'm, I'm sure some therapist would say I, I need to stop talking at this point. But, you know, I think there's a lot to be said for how we now create relationships and how much of those social networks are involved in that and how much we need to consider those, you know, the, the way we're changing as people in our social relationships. So how does that apply to DeFi? Well, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, Pippa brought up Rally. I think Rally is really interesting because it allows for people who are creative, who do have influence to use that influence to allow for new ways to create ecosystems that actually bring some kind of independent economy, independent of what, you know, the world says you have to use. So I think those are coming. But when we think about, you know, the innovations as far as financial innovations, part of it is taking responsibility again. And I know this is somewhat esoteric, but we have basically given responsibility for managing our finances to banks and the Fed and the Treasury. And I'll tell you what, you only have to lose you know, a thousand bucks worth of Bitcoin once because you sent it to the wrong address to realize I have to take responsibility for what I'm doing here. And I think that idea of taking responsibility again as individuals is a seismic shift. And I know that seems small, but I think it's really big. I think, you know, as we start looking at accountability and trust, like, I don't know about you, but you can go to Twitter and find a hundred people that have a hundred different ideas on any topic. You know, you, you go to crypto and you say, okay, I'm going to look up crypto on Twitter. You're going to find, you know, thousands and thousands of people that all have definitive ideas of what crypto is going to be or not be or DeFi. And as we do that, I would love to know, well, you know, how trustworthy is this person? And so I think accountability and trust are going to start to get built into these systems because you're going to see, okay, this person is credentialed this way. This person is credentialed that way. This all comes back to DeFi because those financial systems are going to build more and more on these systems of trust, these decentralized autonomous organizations that have individuals that create more trust, that have influencers that create more trust in systems. And so I, I know that that's not exactly the financial side of it, but I think that's really important as far as organizationally and who we are as humanity, how we relate to each other. We're going to see a much more customized economy that's based on individual ideas and people that actually have followings, but also understand things and can speak the truth. Like, for instance, if someone says, this is what just happened, you know, in at this earthquake site here. And if that person has location data that shows that they're there, that gives them a little more wherewithal than the person who says, this is what's happening over there. And they're just spouting off rumors. There's a lot of ways to create trust. But all that's going to be brought into this DeFi system, all of it. And I think that that's going to be monumental because I don't think our legacy systems, our legacy governments, our legacy financial systems are prepared to deal with the speed at which that is already happening. You know, Clint, what you're saying so reminds me of that wonderful film, Frank Capra film, It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart. And if you recall in that movie, which is, when was that made? Is in the, I don't know, the 40s. And Jimmy Stewart plays kind of the bank manager and money goes missing at the bank. And the whole community knows him, loves him, trusts him that in the end, the whole community pitches in to replace the amount of money that's missing so that he doesn't go to jail. And it's that kind of fundamental faith in who a person is, as interpreted by the community they live in, that now this DeFi crypto system will allow the monetization of that kind of trust. So you know, you go to apply for a mortgage and the fact that everyone in your community knows you, loves you, trusts you actually plays a part in whether you get the mortgage. And 
if you don't pay your bills on time, then actually your capacity to get a mortgage is is affected. So again, it cuts both ways. You know, in China, what we see now is this social credit system means, you know, if you if you date the wrong people, if you don't pay your bills on time, if you express opinions that are contrary to the government, you basically get locked into a digital prison and you're not able to use your credit card outside of your neighborhood. You can't buy a plane ticket because the system won't sell you one. And you can get locked into a place of only four square blocks because of your behaviors. But equally in contrast, if you are doing all the quote right things, you can benefit in immense ways and you know, even internet dating sites in China are now driven by what is your social credit score. And so you want to hang out with or date people who are equally elite to you and your behaviors are going to be good. So this is where I, I start to get nervous when you use the word humanity. I think you're dead right. The, the question for humanity is what behaviors are we corralling people into and are we sure that we want to corral them all into the same behaviors are we sure that we that these behaviors are the quote correct and right ones and and i i go back to quoting frank zappa because he put it so beautifully when he said progress comes from deviating from the norm if you don't deviate from the norm you can't get progress and so it does concern me that as we give the algorithms and the data interpretation, the authority to decide who gets what, are we really sure that these decisions are going to be made on a basis that gives us the best outcome for individuals, for society at large? You know, this is a moment when Karl Popper, who wrote so much about the open society, how open is this society. This is a society where everything is open. And does that actually make us stronger as a society or might that impinge on the freedom of individuals to, you know, stretch and and test the boundaries to deviate from the norm? These are the kinds of questions that I mean when I say this is the wild west of our time. We need to really think about what the right outcome is here. Even if some of the benefits can be fantastic, what is the society that we want? Pippa, I think that is an excellent place to close. So why don't we leave it there? But before I let both of you go, I want to ask you both to tell our listeners a little bit more about what you're doing and how they can follow your work. Pippa, we know you as a best-selling author, ex-presidential advisor, but now you've got this new gig going on in Monaco. What's up there? (laughs) <laughs> yes, I'm a partner of the Monaco Foundry, which is a startup incubator. So it's fantastic because I get the chance to work with all these really cool young people who are building things that are going to change the world and help them make those startups work better, faster, connect them to clients and to capital. And uh, I have to say, it's just the most wonderful thing to have kind of seat at the cutting edge of the world economy and see what the innovators are doing. But I'm also writing, I'm I'm starting to work on a sequel to my old book, Signals, which I think I'm going to be calling Signals and Sensemaking, which is all about how to make sense out of things enough to see the signals and prepare for the future, which is very much what we've been doing in this podcast. And um I've been a little quiet on Twitter and social media while I've been incubating these ideas through lockdown, but we're starting to come out of it. So I look forward to talking to everybody on uh, on social media. I'm on as Dr. Pippa M on most of my social media. Clint Cox, you are actually in the Wild West investing for investors in assets in this area. Tell us a little bit more about what you do. Yeah, so I am co-chief investment officer with Jeremy Epstein of Crypto Futura Fund. And that we're at CryptoFuturaFund.com. But, you know, for the most part, I keep a pretty low profile. Um, I'm not out there on Twitter. I'm not out there, you know, I don't have a lot of commentary. So this is, I, I came out of this because Pippa said it would be a good idea. So I, I uh, generally, like I said, I keep a pretty low profile. But yeah, would love to, uh, you know, talk with anyone if they want to contact us through the website. 
Well, I want to thank both of you for a fantastic summer series. Listeners, we'll be back to our regular format starting next week. For the Macro Voices Podcast Network, I'm Eric Townsend. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at MacroVoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to MacroVoices on iTunes to have MacroVoices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com. <laughs>